Hello and thank you for joining us on the first edition of Journalist Hangout this week. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Today on the program, INEC launches attack on Senator Kwabio, says appeal court judgment vindicates it. Senator says budgetary allocation to roads can only fix 500 out of 3,800 listed for repairs, reconstruction. And later on, on the program, rampaging Liverpool beat Manchester City 3-1 to open eight-point lead in the English Premier League. I will be hanging out with Babajide Kolade Utitoju and Sam Ibemere. Journalist Hangout starts now. Now let's begin the program today on a bright celebratory note. It was a double recognition for TVC News at the 2019 City Pride Achievers Award here in Lagos. The first award of the night went to TVC flagship show Your View, which won the most educative and people-oriented television program of the year. Let's take some remarks on this. City Pride Achievers Award for giving the Your View team this award as the most educative and people-oriented show on TV. We appreciate you for recognizing the effort of all the ladies for the past six years to bring educative content to Nigerians. And of course, our own Babajide Kolade Otitoju also won an award on that night as the media icon of the year 2019. Here's how he reacted to the honor. I feel honored to be here and to be honored with my 12th award of the year. This truly has been an extraordinary year for me, and uh, I thank everyone who has shown belief in me. I thank you for watching Journalist Hangouts. I thank you for your love, the love that you have for us. We can't buy with money. So I'm grateful, and I promise that we will continue to give our best of the program. We will continue to speak truth to power. Because that is what Nigerians want. Nigeria has to get better as a country. Amen. Nigeria must find the right leaders. We do not need misleaders in our country, it's leaders that we want. We will continue to speak the truth because it is the truth that identifies a nation. First of all, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you so it's much. A Festival year for TVC, particularly where awards are concerned. And Babajide Koladi Otitoju is in the front line yeah. ripping of that harvest. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. You. So let's start from the rear. Your award as the media icon of the year. Well, How do you feel? I feel elated. I, I feel happy that the hard work that we put into Journalist uh, Hangout is being rewarded everywhere. And um, it shows, too, that good programming, good content will be appreciated by people. The bedrock of any solid uh, television channel is solid programming. And our people have shown that they appreciate solid programming. That's why your view picked up an award, I think, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. They picked up another one, yes, and um, it just underlines the fact that solid programming is the base for, for any TV. serious and um, um, effective uh, television channel. So we'll continue to do our best. We'll continue to provide Nigerians with what they want. What they want is information. They want to be educated. So we'll continue to do that uh, through the journalists and out. And for you, Sam, yeah. the most people-oriented program, your view on Disputably is that program. Yeah, um, outside journalists and out, your view is uh, one of the most followed programs on, on, on your channel, you know, t uh, TV Continental. And uh, I'd like to say congratulations to 
to the entire team. It's uh, when I'm not watching John Lee's hangout, you, you catch me watching your view, your view because I want to see, the, I want to get, you know, uh, a feeling of the other side of issues, especially when it coming when it's coming from uh, the women folk. So it's, it's it's kudos to the entire uh, team and uh, to my friend and uh, colleague uh, Babajide. Many feathers on his yes, cap. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I was going to say that um, if you discount the rest of the year, I mean, he said that's the 12th award for the year. Now, if he doesn't pick up any other award for the year, it means he would have averaged an award every month. Every month. I, I think that's mm -hmm. massive. Congrats, uh, Congrats. Thank you so and, much. Uh, Thank you very much. I think it's a clear indication of the fact that um, our viewers find value in this program. A lot of engagement. You need to you need to um, see what is happening on the social media handle. Uh, you know handles, and that that tells you you know how engaging the program is. So congratulations mm -hmm. to the entire TVC family. Absolutely. And I'm happy to be part of it. Yes, and yeah. I'm happy to be part of it <laughs> yeah, too. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, when I grow up, I want to be like Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You're already grown up. <laughs> <laughs> I have more years. <laughs> okay, let's start off. The battle for the senatorial seat of Akwaibom Northwest may not just be between Senator Godwin Akwabi of the All Progressives Congress, APC, and Senator Chris Ekwayong of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, also has a stake in that battle. A court of appeal sitting in Calabar nullified the election of Ekwayong and ordered for a run in a Sienudim lo local government area. According to INEC, the judgment is an affirmation of its position that the outcome of the election in the area was marred by widespread violence and irregularities. Akwabio had cried foul over INEC's decision to cancel the election in that area over a purported score of 61,321.29 votes as against the 19,455 accredited on polling day for the entire Asienudim. Gentlemen, uh, first of all, Akwabio hails from Esienudim. Is it a coincidence that uh, the widespread irregularities um, are reported from Esienudim? Babajidi. In the course of the election, Esienudim uh, came to mind because on the election day, journalists were beaten up. Our own reporter, Demula Lawrence was severely beaten. His face was swollen. Uh, when we brought him on air to be part of the discussion about midnight that day, his face was seriously swollen. Um, electoral observers were beaten up. And we reported these things. Our driver, too, who took Demola Lawrence to the polling center, was also beaten up. So it's a fact that irregularities characterize election in ACN Udium. No doubt about it. The facts are there. The, the, the press uh, conference that electoral observers organized and addressed is still there for those who know how to uh, dredge up stories from the internet. It's still there. So it's a fact that the, the, the election was marred by irregularities of all sorts. Now, the, the question to ask is, what was Akpabio's case? Akpabio went to court, urging it to declare him the winner of the election on the basis of 61,429,000 uh, votes. Yes. 329. 329 that came from uh, ACNUD, according to him. But INEC disagrees. INEC said it could not accept that result because the entire accreditation in ACL uh, Odin yielded 19,555 votes, uh, um, persons, which means those who came out on election day and verified by the INEC card reader were just a little more than 19,000, not even up to 20,000. Mm -hmm. So INEC affirmed that the results that Aquabio banks on was not generated by it. And the INEC, the, the, the returning officer affirmed that before the court. So 
what Akpabio went to court to ask for, he did not get. He did not ask the court to order a rerun. He said the court should declare him the winner. So the court, in his wisdom, decided that, you know, he had lost at the lower tribunal. tribunal. Then the upper tribunal decided that, given the uh, principle of, um, what was it called, uh, margin of win, that the, 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 the candidates should go back for a fresh election. Because when you look at the number of registered voters, it's a new deal. Is 109,000 or so. Well, I think 109,555. I'm not. Uh, uh, okay, about 109,000. But, no, 105,555. That's the total register of voters for SNU. But in this case, the election, Equa Young defeated Akpabio. Equa Young scored 118,215. Mm -hmm. Akpabio scored 66,917. <coughs> so where the, 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 the margin of victory in uh, is 38,000 is higher than the number of registered voters. voters, then the court can order a fresh election believing that the outcome could be different uh, when a fresh election is held. But the truth is always that the total number of registered voters don't come out on election day. That has always been the case. Remember the case of Kogi? About 40,000 votes were supposed to be at play based on the number of registered votes. But Yabelo scored just 5,000 votes. On election day, if we are doing all the elections in, uh, uh, during that season, more people come out. There's greater mobilization. But when it comes to rerun, or what I neck likes to call off-season election, usually the turnout is low. Mm -hmm. All reruns that we've had since 1999, the turnouts have always been low. So, Akpabio has a mountain to climb. The margin is 38,000. I do not see Akpabio surmounting that. I do not even see him contesting because he is a minister at this time. To contest, he must first resign. Resign. He must first resign. You know that, <laughs> uh, the, you know, Carl uh, de Fayemi was taken to court and Carl de's argument was that uh, it was primaries of the party that took part in, not, an ele not the national election. So before the national election, Carl de Fayemi had to resign. Resign. In this case, he is already a minister. He cannot be contesting when he's a minister. Henneke Lopobri resigned to go and take part in uh, the electoral process in, in, uh, in, uh, in Bayesa. Now he has to resign. What will he do? Will he now resign and lose all that uh, he has gained within the short time that he became minister? He has had the NDDC match with his ministry. His clout is bigger. Will he now leave all of that to go and contest? Face of it, uncertainty. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We are, are very certain that I cannot <laughs> win. Cannot I win. predicted at that time that I will not win. Out of the 10 local governments in his local government, he lost nine. nine. He wanted to be declared winner based on the result of one local government. That is his own local government. So in this case, being an off-season election, you can be sure that a quite bomb government will direct all his attention to his local government. They will mobilize men and resources. And of course, Aquibom has tremendous resources. They will mobilize them to that place to make sure that he does not win. So <laughs> if I were Akpabio, I will sit where I am in Abuja and continue with my work as Minister of Niger Data and forget about an election that I will not win because I'm certain that I will not win if they do a fresh election. Mm. So, the odds are against Akwabio from what um, uh, Babajide is saying. Uh, do you see a scenario where Akwabio will resign his position, leave certainty for uncertainty? I don't see that. I don't see that. Because, so what happens? Uh, I, I think that uh, Akwabio is a very clever politician. Even though the average Nigerian politician is an incurable optimist, they, they like to believe that they can pull 
you know, um, the tricks at any point in time. But I think that he's a very perceptive person. Uh, the, the permutations don't favor him in any way. I mean, there are about 38,000 votes to, you know, uh, to contest for. Mm -hmm. And the chances are that, Those even are though, yeah, even though that is his uh, local government, chances, chances that Chris, I mean, uh, Ekpeyong wouldn't uh, pick as much, you know, to disrupt the entire calculations is, uh, is, um, is slim. So his chances are, are pretty very slim. And I think he's a very wise person. Um, I would agree with uh, Baba Jj that um, I, I don't see him resigning. But he, like I said, you know, with politicians, they, they like, they enjoy, they enjoy it when the crowd is behind them. So even if he's not going to contest, I see him, you know, moving around the town, make some noise, gets to be noticed because they enjoy it, you know, when people wave at them and, and all that and, and hail them mm -hmm. and, and all that. But um, for all practical purposes, I, I, I don't think uh, Akpabio, given, you know, the chances that, you know, weigh heavily against him, will want to you know, forgo his ministerial portfolio and, you know, contest the, contest the elections. Um, yeah, I expect him to be wise, you know, to know what to do. Otherwise, you go after two things and you lose, you lose, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. I think the chances <coughs> weigh heavily against him in terms of the permutations. Now, Babajide, in the case where Akwabio does not resign based on the uncertainty, uh, there's a legal uh, vacuum that still needs to be filled based on the appeal court's uh, ruling. How do you envisage that this will uh, turn out? Oh, the what are the choices now left to the APC? Honestly, I don't know what they intend to do. The, the truth is, even if they field another candidate, that candidate will not win. Akwaibom has never failed to vote the PDP since 1999. Oh. It's like someone getting up from the PDP and hoping to go and win an election in Borno State. It will not happen. They don't even exist there. In Borno State, you start seeing PDP posters only some months to election. After the election, they fade away again. People begin to hear their names in Abuja and other areas. The same thing in Yobe. There are some states like that. You can't you, you just, these are more or less like one party state. I said it at that time when Akwabio mounted the uh, uh, podium and said everybody in, PD, in, in uh, Akwaibom had become APC. I said that was a lie from the pit of hell, <laughs> meant to impress Mr. President. He knew in his heart that I was not saying the truth. The same thing cross river. If you step out of the family and you go to contest in another party, you will not win. We've seen governors do that. We saw a governor, Mahmouda Shinkafi, leave his party, a sitting governor, leave his party to join the PDP. He did not win, he did not get a second term. Because Zamfara has always been APC. It's the same thing in, in Akwaibom. Whether we like it or not, that is the truth. This one, the, you have, there's just no way that the APC can win Akwabio's local government. I mean, they can win Akwabio's local government. They win Akwabio, but they can't win the election. election. He will not find enough votes to votes. overturn so they, because yeah. he must first overturn the gap of 38,000. That's one. And then ensure that the opponent scores little or nothing. Because the more he scores, the, the higher the mountain for you to climb. Of you course. get the point that I'm making? Mm -hmm. So, and in, in, in that state, if you look at the results of the um, um, assembly election, even for that, uh, that uh, local government, it was won by the PDP, which means that apart from Akpabio, there is really no one, no one formidable enough to win an elective position in that state. That is a fact. And the most dominant politician in that state is Senator Halbert, who comes from uh, Uyo. So this is the this is the thing. The facts of the the the, the 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 pronouncement of the court is clear. 
Yes, Akpabio never asked to be declared winner. It was not in any of his briefs. But the court refused to agree with Akpabio that the 61,000 votes I was talking well, about well, were genuine. Oh. Mm -hmm. If the court had agreed that those 61,000 votes were genuine, then they would have added it to the tally, mm -hmm. and it would have been pronounced winner. winner. But the court refused to do that. It's very clear. So the court just said, okay, um, the elections were held in this area in clear violation of the Electoral Act, then let them go and do a fresh election. So that is, that is where we stand, and everyone will now focus on that. But as I said earlier, I don't see an Akwabio resigning his position as minister to go and contest, because if he contest that election and he loses, and I'm sure he will lose, if he contest that election and he loses, he will have further diminished himself. His standing in the South-South will have been eroded seriously. So it's better that he takes this, he holds on to this like um, um, a redeeming feature, like something, uh, like something that you can term as bragging rights. Right. You can hold on to it that, yes, I was vindicated. But in the real sense, the, in, the real interpretation of the judgment is that it was INEC's position that was, that, that was validated by the court because INEC said, no, elections didn't really take place here. And, and the court said, okay, I'll cancel everything. Mm. So it, it depends on where you belong. If you are an Aquabio's friend, you will think, oh, this was, um, this judgment favored Aquabio. But if it favored him, they would have added the 61,000 plus to the tally, and they would have granted what he asked for, which was that he should be declared winner. So uh, we, people are free to give all kinds of interpretations to what has happened. But in my view, this is uh, the correct interpretation uh, of what has happened. And as you can see, INEX, even by their language, I do not subscribe to the language that INEX used uh, in responding to the court judgment because that language was really, really harsh and uncouth. But given what transpired on election day, INEX staff being abducted, Assaulted. beaten up. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to go on air to challenge the army to go and rescue INEC ad hoc staff who were taken away at midnight on election day. I, we had to go on air with Dejibadi Mosia and uh, the rest of us on, uh, in the studio. We had to go on air to say, look, if truly you work for Nigeria, Nigerian soldiers, go and rescue those boys. They are working for their country. Nobody has any right to kidnap them. So they were kidnapped in this and Yes, and then they were, they were released uh, moments after we, um, mm. we told the uh, soldiers to get cracking. We, we could go on and on about, uh, particularly about the plausibility of um, Aquabio's 61,000 votes, but I want us to quickly look at the flip side. What about the argument, Sam, about cancelling an election based on the valid vote rule against uh, the margin that Babajide <clears throat> pretty much emphasized on. Some say it's a needless waste of time and a delay not just of justice, but also of the you know, progress of the democratic system. And those arguing cite um, I INEC declaring um, Oji Uzokalu winner over the same, another senatorial election where the margin of uh, votes too was, you know, just as much. What are your thoughts? Okay, I, I think um, we're basically dealing with data here. You know, uh, figures don't tell lies, and uh, we must appreciate that. And INEC rules, are, I mean, the, the rules guiding our elections are also, are also very clear. You know, when things don't seem straight, you know, uh, you want to test them out. And I really don't think there's anything wrong in taking these matters before competent for courts, courts, you know, for uh, for adjudication. So um, I would I would agree with those who you know uh, who have argued that we keep learning from you know from from our mistakes. But again, you ask for how long are we going to be in school, you know, learning? But uh, I think that what matters is the lesson that we take away from this at the end of the day. We don't want to incur unnecessary costs. We don't want justice delayed and, and all that. But at the end of the day, if we test these cases in court, 
we set precedents. And for me, I think that is what matters. Because when next it happens, you don't go back asking yourselves what should be done or what ought to be done. So in, in the case of um, Akpaibu and Ekpeyong, you know, in, in, um, in Akpaibom, I think it's just as well that these matters were taken to the courts, tested, and then we have, you know, judgment from, from a competent, competent court. When it does happen next time, we won't be talking about figures that don't tally or figures, you know, that wouldn't make sense to, to you and I as, you know, as uh, members of the public who are observing things. So I think that for us, what matters at the end of the day is that we, we need to continue to deepen, you know, our understanding of electoral processes and where there are gaps, you know, ensure that these gaps, you know, um, are closed up. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day we are, we are all better off for, for it. We want an electoral system that, that is free, fair, and credible, whose integrity when tested, you know, will, will, will stand the test of time. That's what Nigerians are looking for. We want credible polls at any point in time. You know, politicians being what they are will always do what they want to do. They want to win at all costs, especially when they are competing in their unit environment. You don't want to lose because at the end of the day, somebody comes up to you and tells you, my friend, you can't even win your award. Nobody wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. Politicians don't want to listen to, you know, um, they don't want to be shamed, you know, in their own backyard. I think that's, that is why some of them get so desperate. They want to apply whatever they can, including getting violent. You know, to, to, to win. And I think you can, we must, you can say that yeah, again. Let, let's we, take we must, Felix must, from must, Joss. Um, Hello, Felix. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Go ahead and make your contribution. Okay. Actually, it's not a contributor. I think it's actually just like a congratulatory message. I want to congratulate Baba Dide and every other person for the award. They, they do deserve the award. Baba Dide actually here in Joss. We refer to him as uh, the behavior Ariwa. <laughs> we wonder oh, how he gets his information. It's very vast in the north. Congratulations, sir, and well done. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much. Okay, sir, land on your point. Oh, yes. Um, the point I was making is that um, there's, there's a whole lot to take away from, from this experience. And what matters for Nigerians and for our electoral system is that we, we continue to improve on it. At the end of the day, we are bothered more about integrity because the entire world is watching us. And we really don't want to care about how politicians feel. We, want, we care about the integrity of the electoral system. And we must continue to work to ensure that it remains free, fair, credible at all times. Mm. And of course, the evolution of our democratic system. Absolutely. Okay, we'll exit uh, the Akwabio versus Ekweyong and Ainek matter as we move ahead. Still to come, Senator says budgetary allocation to roads can only fix. 500 out of 3,800 roads listed for repair and reconstruction. Stay with Generally Sagout. We'll be right back. We're glad to have you back. You're watching Journalist Hangout on TVC. No doubt Nigeria is battling a dearth of infrastructure like roads, but what is more tragic is the level of response to addressing this issue. While dilapidation of roads is occurring at geometric progression, or should we say a retrogression, efforts to fix them can be said to be going at arithmetic progression. Now the senator representing Oyo North Senatorial District, Abdul Fatai Buhari, has let it be known that the 2020 budget for road repairs and reconstruction can only cover 500 roads out of 3,800 identified as requiring attention across the country. Buhari, who is the Senate Committee Chairman on Land Transport, said the 262 billion naira budgetary allocation to works and housing, the highest in the budget, by the way, can only cover 500 roads. Uh, gentlemen, I, I guess the first or the immediate reaction of any Nigerian to this revelation would be, is the country broke, Babajide? Yes, we are. We are broke. I've said it uh, repeatedly. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that you hear from our leaders, but we are broke. We are borrowing money all over the place. And um, you keep hearing that the, there's nothing wrong with us borrowing that the debt to GDP ratio of Nigeria 
is a healthy one. But the issue is the revenue. Countries that have the sort of debt to GDP ratio that we have, the, their income streams can be compared to, to our own. We have issues with revenue. The revenue generating agencies, they are trying their best, but their best is apparently not good enough. So we can't find enough money to fix infrastructure. Infrastructure that in some cases uh, is more than 50 years old, we can't fix because we've not, uh, we, we, we just can't find the money. The current budget, the current um, 10 trillion naira budget for our country, already we, we are in the market shopping for a loan of 2.5 trillion. Bi uh, no, 2.5 billion dollars okay. to fund the budget. Already, we are budgeted 2.4 trillion to service debt. Mm -hmm. So, even without being told, you know that that is a budget that has already come with deficits. 2.4 trillion of it going to debt servicing. Debt servicing. You are going to borrow 2.5 billion dollars to fund that the same budget. budget. Yes. So the figure may be quite high, but as you can see. Before, really before, before I go to Sam, let me quickly ask you, where does this leave the reassurance by the finance minister that the 27.4 trillion naira debt Nigeria owes is nothing to worry about? Well, of course, it's something to worry about. Actually, if we continue on the path that we are, you can't just keep taking loans from the Chinese the way, the way we are taking. Some of the African countries who, who took plenty of loans from Cameroon, I mean, from, uh, from the Chinese, China. you know, countries like Ethiopia, they are already regretting. Because, yes, you took so much loans for infrastructure here and there, but when the Chinese come for these loans mm -hmm. and the kind of conditionalities that they will give you, you will then tell yourself that, look, when, when, when it's time to pay back, you then tell yourself, why did I even get into this? I've, I've seen stories of people lamenting in, uh, in Ethiopia that, look, we took far too much from these people and, and all that. So we shouldn't uh, inexorably walk into a fresh uh, uh, form of colonialism by simply taking loans left, right, and center. If we, if, if we are not careful, we will even get to the point that creditors will not want to give us loans anymore. We will get to that because clearly they have to even look at your revenue. It doesn't support taking the uh, loans with, with the frequency that we are taking these loans. And in spite of that, we can't find money to fix infrastructure. So we have to look for alternative sources of, um, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, revenue. The other day I was reading that um, Dangote is helping us to repair the national stadium in Abuja. And I was really ashamed because when you imagine how much money was spent on that national stadium and how Obasan just justified this when people told him that, look, if you had sunk the same amount of money into housing, rent would have crashed in Abuja and he, he didn't want to listen and spend that much money on that stadium <laughs> and we abandoned it for years to be taken over by rodents. Now Dangote has come to help us fix it. It's the same Dangote who helped us to build the, the, the road in Obajana. It's the same Dangote that is helping to fix a papa, you know? Hmm. So things, things that normally we, we, we expect us as a, as a government to do on our own, Dangote is having to intervene left, right, and center. So in my view, since there are big companies in our country, some of those companies, we can give them tax holidays in exchange for helping us to fix critical infrastructure. Because first of all, we never find enough money to fix all the roads in Nigeria. It will get angry and out of frustration, it will say uh, it? things, uh, it things that it shouldn't say. Later on, it will say <laughs> it was misquoted. It was misquoted. So, the, the, this is the truth. This is the truth. He knows that. We, we all agree now that what 
has been allocated to Fashola is just not enough for him to solve the problem. So the National Assembly has to jack up what's been allocated to him because I looked at, I was reading what uh, Senator Buhari said. That is if they are not going to spend part of this budget allocation on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway or the um, Second Niger Bridge. Because in my view, they will still have to spend money on those roads. So when you when they say uh, you cover 500 roads, no, if they have, they've deemed those two roads very very critical, economically, I mean critical to our economic development in our country. So if they have money, that is where their the attention will, will be directed before they start remembering some uh, roads here and there. So we may not even be able to fix 500 roads that he's talking about because if they take about 900 million, they've been told that uh, 900 billion, uh, I said 900 billion, if they take about 90 billion to fix because they have a deadline of 2020 to deliver Lagos Ibadan Expressway. So you expect uh, plenty of uh, activity on that road. So if they take like 90 billion and pump on that road so that they can meet the target, how much will be left? And then you must remember that the second Niger Bridge is there. So I don't even think that those roads, those in, uh, intercity roads, that we talk about, uh, inter interstate roads that we are really worried about. At the end of the day, we may not find money to even fix them because our attention will be on those two very critical uh, highways. Mm. Sounds as if government is between the devil and the deep blue sea where that is concerned. But for you, Sam, um, against the backdrop of uh, Babaji Day's uh, commentary, we have 42 billion as at the last check in the foreign reserve. The excess uh, crude account is um, about uh, $274 million as at August. And uh, if the benchmark, current bu budget benchmark to crude oil price is $50 and is sold right now for $62. And, you know, the challenge that uh, government has with infrastructure, what does it say about uh, its competence to manage the economy? The fundamentals don't look good. And that is one point that has been, you know, made uh, this evening. They don't look good at all. Um, you have a budget that is already laid out, and then we have assumptions that we're going to earn. Uh, given the projections that you've talked about, we're going to earn about maybe eight trillion, eight, eight trillion, uh, you know, or thereabout. But the fact is that we have never come close to what we have budgeted as income. Oftentimes, it hovers between a little over maybe three trillion and, and all that. So even even though we have um, proposed or projected that we are going to earn out of that ten million, that we're going to earn about eight trillion. Okay, chances are that given the benchmark that you have talked about and the volatility in the industry that we are hoping we are going to earn a lot, a lot of money from, chances are that we, we, we may not even come very close to the eight trillion that we believe we are going to earn to be able to you know, deal with the infrastructure. So the fundamentals don't look, don't look good at all. And I think that is why um, the government is all over the place you know, shopping for, for funds. What we have you know, staring us in the face is, is a death trap. We, we can't run away from it. And those who know have warned that we have to be very careful. You know, we've talked about GDP to, to debt, but I agree with those who have argued that what is critical and what we, should, what we should be paying attention to is the revenue side of it. How can we get a bit more creative to ensure that you know, we pull more resources you know, and, um, and, gr and grow the economy? So the fundamentals, like I said, really don't look good. At this time you know, um, in our history, we need men who, who understand very clearly you know, what it takes to run the economy. And maybe that's, that's you know, um, one reason we should you know, uh, be commending the president for taking another look, you know, at, at his entire economic management team and then bringing in individuals we believe are very well versed and experienced who can offer great ideas on how we can, you know, turn around our economy, especially on, 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 the, on the revenue side. So at this time we need to, 
you know, uh, be, be true to ourselves. And maybe that's why the government, you know, is, uh, is applying all manner of austere measures and all that. So these things you see about border closure, ban on importation, you know, uh, closing the forex window to some items and all that, is essentially because the signals that we face are very clear. Because we are not making enough money, we want to be sure that the, the little that we have, we can husband it better and ensure there are no wastages. Is That's that a creative approach, the border closure that you talk about? Um, well, maybe to some extent. Creativity for me now will mean being able to so get... Pragmatic yeah, 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 maybe pra like, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> but, but again, um, on, on, on the creative side, you probably will be looking at how much of our tax base we are widening, we are able to you know, widen and, and bring, bring in more persons. That is one area I think that the government needs to do a lot more. We want to commend Paolo what, what he has done, but there's a lot, so many Nigerians who are outside the, you know, the tax net. The tax net. Okay? And it, it's a painful thing, but we have to go through it. We have to go through it. Nigerians have to come S to that speaking realization. Speaking of pain, let me yeah. come to Babajide. You said earlier that uh, perhaps what the government should do is give those companies tax holidays. But then again, Nigerians uh, who are further down below the rung of the ladder are being taxed. And the complaint out there is you are uh, you know, taxing the, the, the poor and then the rich are having a, a field day, you know, where there are hard times in the, on the, in the economy. What do you think? No, 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 no the, we must tax the rich. We must uh, put uh, every taxation on luxury items, for example. And I believe that even the jacking up of, uh, of the parts that's... actually touches the rich because it is things that you buy in supermarkets and all that that uh, you pay VAT on, not not the people, not what when it? you go and buy tomato from Yaloja and all of the, no. So we have to target the rich, get the rich to pay taxes. A lot of them are only interested in cutting corners, bribe tax officials and get away with blue murder. We have to improve the collection. If we improve the collection, as we have seen with customs, because Amid Ali has improved the, uh, the collection of, um, <coughs> what's it called, for, uh, for customs, duties. duties and the rest. And he has made it more transparent. In the past, if you wanted to auction um, customs and seized vehicles, people would just talk to those they know, yeah, my friend, help me now. This thing. But these days, it's transparent. You go online. And bid for and, it. And bid for it. So that way, we'll get more revenue. And But because of the inclement uh, nature of the business environment, and imports are not coming in as they should, then we are not making enough money, you know. But with the, uh, I know that with the closure of the border, they, they've, they've made, met their target already. And one can see clearly that if it is sustained for a few more months, they'll make more money. But in my view, we should be doing much better than that. We cannot close the borders indefinitely. You know? sure. We can't close the borders indefinitely. We must find ways to secure our borders, get the buy-in of our neighbors, you know, um, uh, to the point that we can make money from those things that they are bringing in uh, through, through their countries. All right. We hope that uh, more funds will come in and uh, perhaps that 500, that number 500 will go up uh, to a little more, you know, to cover infrastructure development of federal roads. Moving on now. Let's go on another short break. But when we return, me and Akira will join us for sports. Stay with January's Hangout. Yes, very glad to have you back on Journalist Hangout on TVC. In what many consider to be an explosive encounter in the battle for the 2019-2020 English Premier League title, Liverpool made a statement of intent by beating reigning champions Manchester City 3-1 at Anfield with goals from Fabinho, Mosala and Sadio Mane. 
the Reds struck a potentially decisive blow in the Premier League title race to open up an eight-point lead at the top of the table. While Liverpool celebrated the victory over the defending champions, manager Pep Guardiola will know that a third successive Premier League title may be out of reach. Reach, rather. Welcome, Mia Nakiri. Thank you for joining us on out. Journalist Hangout. And no, Babachide is still with us. But mm -hmm. thank you, Sam, for joining us. Sam has uh, taken an exit. Uh, so, arguably, it's the biggest match so far. Mia, let's start with you. Well, um, for the weekend, it was the biggest football match. Um, Liverpool, Manchester City. And if there is a place you don't want to play Liverpool, it's at Anfield. For Manchester City last season, Anfield was on a favourable ground for them. And then when you take a look at it, the injuries, um, their form so far, um, it was really shaky, you know, going to Anfield. But then if there was anything that could stop the unbeaten run of Liverpool as far as the Premier League is concerned today, um, it was Manchester City. They last lost 900 days ago, you know, to say Manchester City side. But this time about it was a different ball game entirely. Mm -hmm. Three goals to one, Liverpool all you know all the way but then it's early days it's early days, early days. so speaking of which Babajide, will this be their year for a trophy for the reds mm, i will be able to say yes or no after december um in december you play many games and it's really really the test of nerves test of endurance for clubs because if you are playing over a period of 10 days, if you get to play about four games, even three games, and then FA Cup, you put FA Cup in the mix early in January, clubs really suffer. During the, during the um, holidays, they want you to play, I mean, they, they want the players to play many games. That's the way the Premier League has been designed. Okay. The period from um, um, the 22nd to, to even the 2nd of January, 22nd of December to 2nd of January, you play many games. So unlike the situation um, um, during the season, when you merely play one game a week, you find that they are playing no less than seven games in a month so that that really weakens teams and uh, you what what you get to see is a harvest of injuries on the part of a uh, club so after december because you play many games some players will be injured we want to see and it's difficult to win all your games at that time okay that's when most clubs drop points okay. so we want to see how liverpool responds response to the avalanche of matches um, uh, between the, uh, uh, the, the, the December, first day of December and to January. January 2nd. And then let us see where they stand on the table after that. But they've shown that they have the hunger. It's not as if they are better than, um, than Man City, but they showed greater hunger. One team showed that it wanted victory more. And that team was um, was was Liverpool. Liverpool. It may well be their year, but just as Mia said, it's all it is. Mm. Now, uh, following that narrative, now will it be a two-horse race even after the testy match period of December to January? Yeah, I, I want to believe it's going to be a two-horse race this season. Um, Leicester City at the moment and Chelsea um, are not doing badly. Eight points, you know, down the pecking order to Liverpool. But um, if you take a look at them, what Liverpool have been able to do over the years, even when they sleep, um, let's take a look at last season, for example, they finished in the top two. Um, at this stage, after 20 games last season, um, Liverpool were 10 points clear of Manchester City. Manchester City, as at that time, had played 19 games. And um, you would realise that um, despite Liverpool having most points, um, their best points ever, in a league season, they still finished second. Any fan out there could easily put his or her money on Liverpool Football Club winning the league title this season. 
but for a Liverpool fan, a Toro Anfield bread, who has followed Liverpool over the years, will never. And from the likes, from the years of Kenny Daglish, 1990, 1991, when he was in charge of Liverpool, after 13 games, Liverpool indeed had eight points ahead of, you know, the second, they were eight points ahead of the second place team. At the end of the day, they could not win the league. Under Gerard Ulie, the same thing. Um, you want to talk about under Brendan Rogers when Steven Gerrard slipped and Chelsea did rally back. It was the free fall, you know, of Liverpool. They've always had this momentum. They are the nearly men of English football. They mm. will always come close, but within the twinkle of an eye, you know, they fall like a pack of cards and that's the end. But a good thing going for them at this point in time is the fact that even their young players, you know, have matured, they've developed mm. so far. Robertson right. on the left hand side, Alexander Arnold on the right hand side, you know. Arnold is also giving a lot of assists, not just for, you know, the likes of um, Mane and, um, not even the job for the likes of Mane and um, mm. Salah, but you've got a lot of assists and younger players are coming up. So let's see if um, Liverpool will be able to navigate the December January period. If they do, they are almost home and dry. Okay. We won't do justice to this without talking about the VAR. Babajide, yeah. has the VAR been dependable in, uh, you know, finding a solution to referees' errors? I like, I like the VAR, but I don't like the way it is applied in England. I want to see a situation in which the referee, who is the main arbiter of the game, goes to the goes to look at the video himself because what we see in england is sometimes they just take the decision and tell the referee no that is not a goal it happened when arsenal played uh, sheffield no uh, crystal palace that goal the, uh, that, that um, the, the, the defender, defender yes. scored socrates if socrates goal was a good, was goal. A good goal the referee most probably will have allowed it, but he, he, he got a call uh, from the VAR indicating that that was not a goal, you know. And we watched that thing repeatedly. It was Liverpool, clear. Leicester City. That then you saw the Liverpool, uh, Le uh, Liverpool, Leicester City. Clearly, Sadio Mane did what you call simulation. He, he, that was he, he made a meal of that uh, 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 touch or contact by the Leicester player and then con the referee to allow a goal. I want referees in England to be able to look at that's what happens in, 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 in the, in the well, Champions well, League. Why is so the VR system closed? Honestly, I do not know. And that's why you see a lot of inconsistency in the application of VAR in England. Um, there are occasions when you could say, oh, VAR has saved some teams from losing, you know, when they ought really not to lose. Look at a goal that Man United scored um, from an offside position. The, the, the VAR picked it. I think it was against uh, Arsenal, and it was uh, the goal was cancelled. And then there was an handball leading to a goal that Man City scored against Tottenham. The VAR uh, chalked it off. So there are occasions when you could say, "Oh no, VAR did well." But the inconsistency, nearly every match, the, the, the headlines the have to do with the VAR. VAR. It's usually the talking point after every game. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, we saw clear ball handling that the referee didn't do anything about. And you expect at least the VAR will have picked it up. That's it. Mm. The build up to the goal of the match. Um, All right, we we'll mm -hmm. hope the VAR system will be reviewed and made to be more democratic, particularly in the English Premier League. Thank you very much, Mia Nakiri, Babajide, oh, Koladi, Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Yeah. And of course, Sam Ibemere, thank you very much. That's all we have for you on Journalist Hangout today. But you can join us again tomorrow for another edition of the program. You can also watch Journalist Hangout on other platforms showing on your screen and on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is Journalist Hangout at tvcnews.tv. Thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel. Webimo. Bye for now. God bless Nigeria.